And our debate continues with a question for Dr. Maxwell. Dr. Maxwell, despite the booming economy, the city of Rochester has one of the highest poverty rates in the nation. With the understanding that this is a complex issue, why do you think this is? What's preventing this community from turning this around? Yes, I, I, that's a great question and, and one that gets to the heart of um, what kind of future we're going to have. Um, we do have one of the highest poverty rates, childhood poverty rates uh, in, in, in the city of Rochester and it's unconscionable. Um, I'm old enough and long enough here to remember a completely different uh, set of circumstances. Uh, I think one of the fundamental uh, things we need to do is to get jobs into the community. Jobs, secure, good paying jobs uh, will go a long, long way towards uh, uh, securing kids' futures here. Another thing we need to improve school performance. I think the school performance in the city schools uh, is, is, is abominable. And I think improving uh, school performance and school activities will go a long way towards helping kids uh, raise themselves uh, out, of, out of poverty. Uh, I think that uh, there's it would be difficult from a federal standpoint to legislate for one uh, individual district, uh, but uh, I think the solution is better economics, uh, better jobs, higher paying jobs, uh, connecting jobs that are rising in the uh, uh, periphery uh, through better transportation so people in the city can get out to those jobs. Uh, I think tackling the opioid uh, epidemic uh, that uh, makes uh, parents not so good parents uh, because they're so trying to get money for the next fix will also help. Uh, uh, the usual uh, response from Washington is we need to send in more money. I don't think that's, uh, that's going to help. Mr. Morelli? Yeah, I think this is uh, obviously not only uh, a great challenge to us, but uh, people in this community ought to be rightly alarmed at the, uh, not only the, uh, the amount of poverty, but how extreme and how concentrated it is, and particularly among children. And uh, we have a lot of well-meaning people for many years have built services, educational services, health services, human services, um, but they are not connected in a meaningful way. One of the things that I've uh, really worked on uh, the last few years is to bring people together to talk about a, a collective impact, uh, to make sure that people uh, work together in ways that are more meaningful. Meaning if you have a child in school who's not succeeding, it may not have anything to do with their educational attainment. It may be because they're hungry and don't know where their next meal is. So what I am uh, working on is building a new integrated system of delivery that will bring together social services, health services, and educational services and really give the children and connected adults and their family members the opportunity to bring all those services together in what I like to call a 360 degree or comprehensive way of looking at it. Look, we, we can't continue to do the same things that we've done for decades because the solutions are, are just uh, not working, the proposed solutions. We need to do something very differently. All right, we'll switch gears now. Mr. Morelli, this question actually is for both of you. Uh, you've both suffered the loss of a loved one to breast cancer. Mr. Morelli, your daughter, Lauren, and Dr. Maxwell, your wife, Janice. How does this loss impact your call to service? Well, for me, um, it has left a profound impact uh, on my life and uh, on my children's life, my wife's life, um, our grandkids. Uh, I think one of the reasons I'm so passionate about women's health issues, uh, one of the reasons I'm so passionate about the question of pre-existing conditions in our health care system, uh, we can't have people who suffer from cancer not be able to get health insurance or be able to get it at such rates that it's not affordable. We need to make sure there's no lifetime caps on uh, benefits uh, under insurance. Those are things I care very deeply about. I know Dr. Maxwell does as well. Um, this has uh, affected the way I view uh, my service profoundly as well. Um, and I'm gonna continue to work as hard as I can in the public or private sector to make sure we have an impact and get to a point where none of us have to suffer what, uh, what both of us have gone through. Dr. Maxwell? Um, yes, this is difficult to talk about, but um uh, as my wife was uh, fading, uh, she said, <laughs> what are you going to do after I'm gone? And uh, I said, um, I'm going to run for Congress. And she said, you have my blessing. So um, uh, I would like to uh, end breast cancer once and for all, not only for what uh, Joe Morelli has gone through and I have gone through, but for the women and this is every woman in Monroe County, 
when they go in for a mammogram and they're told to go out and wait in the waiting room, the terror that ensues is unbelievable, waiting for the results uh, of the mammogram. And that's universal. And I think for that uh, uh, problem with the whole community, the fear and the anxiety, plus those that get breast, breast cancer and have to go through uh, such horrific treatments, uh, we have to do better. And I would love to see the University of Rochester be funded and be one of the main uh, um, uh, centers in the world on breast cancer and to conquer breast cancer right here in Rochester. And I would like to throw out a proposal to Assemblyman Morelli. No matter how this election turns out, I think uh, we both could put shoulder to shoulder to the boulder, and together we could uh, uh, make that happen. That is, uh, curing breast cancer here in Rochester. I would welcome that. All right, Dr. Maxwell, thank you both. Uh, Dr. Maxwell, according to several national polls, one of the most popular provisions of the Affordable Care Act is its protections for people with pre-existing conditions. Yesterday, President Trump tweeted, and again repeated at a rally, uh, something along these lines, Republicans will protect people with pre-existing conditions far better than Dems. Do you agree with that or not? And why? I don't know about better than Dems or uh, uh, th th this. This is uh, this is not a uh, this is not a partisan issue. That's why I'm running for Congress. I'm sick of the bipartisan divide that allows nothing to get done. Pre-existing conditions. Look, I'm a doctor. Okay, I've treated thousands of patients here. And do you, does anybody think that I would take all the patients I have treated, they all have pre-existing conditions, and move against them in any way? No, I am all in on pre-existing conditions. I think to have an illness, to have a cancer, to have an arthritis, to have whatever it is, and have that become an exclusionary reason not to get health care or enough health care is ridiculous. I have always been in favor of pre-existing condition coverage, and I think it is one of the good things that came out of Obamacare. Mr. Morelli? Well, I think the problem is the national Republicans haven't embraced us until it became a campaign issue about two weeks ago. And the truth is, the way they have structured it would cost people so much money. It's fine to say we'll make sure that pre-existing conditions are covered. It's just gonna cost you tens of thousands of dollars and make it unaffordable. That's not the protections we need. I'm very proud of the fact that I helped write the law in New York. So no matter what happens nationally, New York is gonna be protected because we have consumer rights under our law. Uh, and I was very proud, as I said, to be able to write that, help write that law. Um, but this is a question, it's a, um, a question of how is it gonna be done? Are you gonna pay extra because you had a pre-existing condition? Which essentially takes away the protections that you have. You can say, well, you can buy it. We're just going to put a premium on it, or it's gonna, you're going to go into a separate pool of people, which means it's unaffordable. So if it's unaffordable, it's unattainable. And, uh, and frankly, whatever the president says, I question because uh, he changes his opinion about every 20 minutes. I, I would just respond that uh, I think uh, we should hold ourselves up here in Rochester as a national model because basically health care in this community is community rated. In other words, people uh, who are young and healthy and people who are sick and old, tend we pay the same rate. We have community uh, ratings here, and I would pray that that's the way it would be for the country as well. And just because you get sick um, should not be an impediment uh, to full-throated insurance. And you shouldn't have different uh, uh, rates for the sick, and you shouldn't be excluded uh, from um, purchasing into that plan or that plan because of a pre-existing condition. I'll give you a chance yeah, to... Yeah, well, I, I'm delighted to talk about that because I helped write that law, too, in 1993, the community rating law, which is uh, the strongest in New York as it is anywhere in the country, and there ought to be a community rating law in the United States. Uh, or certainly every state ought to adopt it. We do have that in New York, and that allows for much larger pools. It allows for less expensive insurance uh, as you age and you find yourself in the position where you have made more chronic or episodic illnesses. So it's the law of the land in New York, and I'm very proud because I helped write that law. Mr. Morelli, we know you support the Affordable Care Act, but there are several real concerns about th this law. 
uh, it has many flaws, including the high cost of some individual plans for people who are healthy. How would you fix the current law? Well, I do like elements of the Affordable Care Act. There are a number of things that I did not like, even if it was being passed. I didn't like the fact that it exempted negotiations by the federal government with Big Pharma. Uh, to bring down the cost of, uh, of drug care. Uh, I think there are some things we absolutely need to do when it comes to health care. First of all, I believe it's a human right. I think every American ought to be covered. And I, ought, I think one of the better features of the Affordable Care Act was the individual mandate. Um, you're born, you have a body that needs to be insured against all kinds of health issues. We can't allow young people who feel invulnerable to not buy insurance uh, and put that on the, on the backs of older people. And, and showing up at the emergency room without any kind of insurance isn't a way to build a health care system. Here's the fact of the matter, that in order for us to bring down insurance rates in this country, we have to build a lower cost health care system and a system that allows everyone without regard to the color of their skin or the zip code in which they live to have quality health care. The only way you can do that is to build more incentives on wellness programs, uh, get people to have primary care, go through acquired screenings. We can do this. Um, but it will take some real effort, but we have to make sure everyone is insured and insured at rates that are uh, viable. We're blessed in this community. We have two of the lower cost health insurers, not for profits, uh, anywhere in this country. And we have a high quality of service in this community, uh, but we can do far better. And there are some elements of the Affordable Care Act that I do think uh, are important. Some uh, that I think, and I mentioned uh, as it relates to being able to negotiate with pharmaceutical companies to really drop down uh, the cost of, uh, of uh, prescriptions. Dr. Maxwell, how would you fix the current law? There are features of the Obamacare that I said I think are good. One is protection for pre-existing. Another one, as a parent, uh, I found very appealing is keeping your kids on your insurance plan uh, without an additional cost until they're 26. I think that is a big comfort uh, to any parent with kids in college. The problem with health care is it's too expensive, okay? That's the elephant in the room. It's too expensive. If your health care plan was $120 a month for you and your family, we wouldn't be having this conversation. It's too expensive. And I think to lower cost, you've got to introduce competition. Competition. And my plan would be for employers to not write a big bundled check to Excellus, but instead write individual checks to individual employees, tell them to put it in their health savings account, and then they could pick the insurance plan that's right size for them, and insurance companies would compete for individual businesses. I think we ought to take the gloves off Medicare uh, uh, as far as Big Pharma is concerned, and I think we ought to allow uh, competition and drugs to come in from uh, foreign countries. That would drop the price precipitously. Can I, uh, uh, Dr. Maxwell has said this at a number of forums, and I just want to, again, disabuse him of this. There is significant competition among health insurers. There are more than two dozen insurers nationally and locally that can write insurance in the state of New York. There are also, there's no prohibition on an individual company giving money to an employee to go out and make the best deal that they can. But you can't make a good deal when you're just by yourself. It's in, going into the individual marketplace. The, the whole important part of insurance is if you want it to work and you want to drive down costs, you have to share risk and build bigger pools, not smaller ones. So there's adequate competition. The reason you don't see more competition in the Rochester region for health insurance is because the two primary insurers, Excellus and MVP, are among the best in the country. They're not-for-profits, and they do exceedingly well at providing coverage uh, and now that's, we have a long way to go, but that's why you don't see more competition. People can't beat their prices. I would disagree with that. I, do you know 81% of uh, American companies offer only one insurer to their employees. The choice is between high deductible, low deductible, and the copay plan. That's the only choice you get. If you wanted to uh, get your health insurance from Blue Cross Blue Shield of Oklahoma, you can't. And uh, the problem is, it, it, it would be analogous to buying a car. If your company said everybody had to buy a Chevrolet and you could pick between red, green, and blue, that's no competition. You should be able to be in the driver's seat, picking your own plan, 
uh, uh, barriers around states uh, for insurance plans should go away and uh, individuals should be able to right size an insurance uh, plan that's good for them and if they get cheaper and they can keep some money from their employer in their HSA it rolls over year to year and and if you put enough years together maybe you can get to the point where you can fund your own purchasing of health insurance and retire at the age of 55. So this is an important point. I really want to go through this. It's simply not true what the doctor said. You can get insurance. Now, what you do in New York is you get a New York license. There are plenty of national companies and companies from all over the United States uh, that can get a New York license. And what that does, what he's suggesting is you get it from anyone around the United States without a New York license, I think is what he's saying, um, which means all the consumer protections in New York would go away. You wouldn't be admitted to uh, offer insurance in New York, which means the Department of Insurance wouldn't approve the rates. Uh, it also means that there might not be adequate capitalization or reserving. If a company in Oklahoma wrote it and New York had no way to regulate it and they run out of money and don't pay claims, all those consumer protections will be wiped away. It, all you have to do is comply with New York law and you get a New York license. Aetna has one, United Health has one. Right. They're not headquartered in New York. It's simply wrong. All right, we're going to move on, if you don't mind. Uh, Dr. Maxwell, let's uh, talk about what you would do if you were elected. Name three committees on which you'd like to serve in the U.S. House. The first uh, committee would be uh, energy and commerce. Why? Because it's where most of the health care uh, legislation is uh, proposed, promulgated, and brought to the floor. And I have a, I think, a very unique perspective on health care. I come at it from the patient's point of view. I have seen the underbelly of uh, the health care system, how people get neglected and forgotten. I personally have solved the problem in my practice. If people come and they have no insurance, I give my care for free. And I've done that uh, forever. Uh, but obviously that's not a solution to the uh, nation's problems. Uh, so energy and commerce would be the first one. Um, the next one would be uh, natural resources and nat uh, na national parks because I envision a national greenway park, national monument starting at High Falls, going all the way down one bank of the river to Charlotte, starting at Charlotte and coming all the way back up to High Falls. I think people can't afford to go to Yellowstone. They can't afford to go to Bar Harbor. Why not bring the National Park to them? One, so One more committee. One more committee would be Foreign Affairs. Simply put, uh, because I would like to contribute to a solution to the Palestinian-Israeli uh, conflict. Ooh, more on that in a moment. Mr. Morelli? Yes, yeah, actually in the House of Representatives, the most you can serve on is two committees, and uh, there are a number oh, thank of... thank you. No, that's okay. <laughs> and there are a number of exclusive committees that only allow you to serve on one. Uh, the one committee I'd like to serve on is the Ways and Means Committee uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, most prominently is because the tax bill which was passed this past year is an affront to all Americans. 83% of the benefit went to the top 1%, multimillionaires and billionaires. Uh, it hasn't helped create a single job. It hasn't repatriated virtually any company to the United States, which was its stated goal. It has added $2 trillion to the national debt. It has uh, limited severely the ability of New Yorkers uh, to duct their state and local taxes, which has been a feature uh, of our tax system since the uh, uh, income tax system was invented in the early 20th century. I think it's uh, an affront to every New Yorker. Uh, everyone watching is going to pay more uh, next year if they have high, uh, high uh, local taxes. And um, the interesting feature of the bill also is that it's a permanent tax cut for multimillionaires and billionaires. And the middle class got a small tax cut for a short time, which is going to go away. Sorry, I would violently disagree with that. I would violently disagree with that. I think a unemployment rate of 3.7 is phenomenal. I think the boost in GDP that has occurred since the uh, tax uh, uh, law is phenomenal. I think an average of $1,000 in the pocket of the average New Yorker is uh, not what Nancy Pelosi said, uh, crumbs from the table. It's real. It's real money. And uh, I think the uh, uh, tax uh, of 21% on industries has unleashed 
the power of American uh, uh, industry on a uh, world stage. I think the uh, tax plan um, has done a great job. I would agree, however, living in New York State with the taxes and mandates, unfunded mandates that come down the throughway from Albany, uh, that we are in a vulnerable uh, position on the salt taxes. And if I get to Congress, uh, I would fight to undo that portion of it. You know, I would say as it relates to this, I get up every morning and the sun rises every morning as well. I would hardly say I'm responsible for it. The recovery in the United States is now 100 months old, nearly eight and a half years, and President Obama was the president during most of that. The tax bill, which is less than six months old, is hardly, resp hardly responsible for the growth in, uh, in our economy, not to mention the disparities between certain groups when it comes to employment. But having said that, the tax bill came much later. The recovery has been going on for nearly eight years. Uh, Mr. Morelli, there has been an ongoing debate about President Trump's taxes. Um, questions about his global uh, business empire. He has built this, uh, whether he has financial entanglements with Russia or other conflicts of interest, or even whether he violated the law to avoid paying taxes. There, is, there are rumblings right now in Congress to compel President Trump to release his taxes. Would you support that? Well, I think uh, Donald Trump is, as far as I know, certainly in the modern age, uh, the only person to be a candidate or to be president who hasn't released his tax returns. The truth is, Donald Trump, by just about every account, is a terrible business leader. He's gone bankrupt many times. Uh, if you and I were, went bankrupt at the rate Donald Trump was, you wouldn't have much of an economy at all. Um, he doesn't seem to have even the most basic knowledge of how our national economy works or the global economy, which is why he has willy-nilly slapped tariffs here and there based on some whim. Uh, his national economic advisor, Gary Cohn, from Goldman Sachs, resigned. Uh, rather than work with the president, who he said essentially had a fifth grade uh, uh, knowledge base around the economy. Donald Trump should make clear what his national interests are, what his economic interests are. He's making money as president right now. You see diplomats have to use uh, the Trump Hotel. Um, it, I think it's just a shame what he has done. I think his lack of candor, his lack of integrity, uh, not to mention his complete lack of understanding of the national or global economy. Dr. Maxwell, should Congress compel the president to release his taxes? Yes. Uh, let, 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 me, let me go on here. This race in this district is about who will represent this district in co uh, uh, Congress the most effectively. It is not about Donald Trump. I am a proud Republican. I've always been a Republican. I'm going to die a Republican. The Republican has a bigger tent than most people realize. And uh, I keep hearing this injection of Donald Trump, Donald Trump, Donald Trump, Donald Trump into this race by uh, Assemblyman Morelli. I am not Donald Trump. He has never called me. I have never called him. And from the National Republican Party down in Washington, I haven't received a single cent. 98% of the money that I have uh, uh, used in this campaign has come from citizens in Monroe County. Now, I think Donald Trump some, has done some very good things. First of all, he listened to a bunch of people who were not being listened to. They saw their jobs go overseas. They saw their wages stagnate. They saw their towns fill up with opioids. And he listened to them. And he gave them a voice, and he gave them a platform, and he hasn't deviated from that platform one iota. On the other side of the coin, I think uh, uh, the way he tweets and the way he uh, talks about groups of people, especially about women, is not right. And I will go to Washington, and I will stand up to him if he's doing things that I think are, are, are not right for Monroe County, but I object making this race uh, a decision about Donald Trump. It isn't. It's about Joe Morelli and Jim Maxwell. I, I wish Donald Trump wasn't the issue either. But then again, I wish he wasn't the president. Um, the truth is he is. He looms large over the midterm elections. I consider this the most important election in our public's history because he has set the nation on a horrible path, one of divisiveness, one of ugliness. He refers to the press is the enemy of the people. Can you imagine our framers who wrote the, the, um, the Bill of Rights and the First Amendment to protect the press 
and give it freedom. Could you imagine what they would think about a president who routinely holds rallies calling and pointing to them and calling them the enemy of the people? I can't. So Donald Trump is an issue. And frankly, uh, with all due respect to uh, Dr. Maxwell, it's not what's in Donald Trump's tweets that bother me. It's what's in his heart. And that is why this is a very important issue uh, in this election. It can't not be. All right. Uh, Mr. Dr. Maxwell, every election cycle, candidates for Congress say there's too much toxicity in politics and it must stop. And yet, it is worse than ever. Beyond saying it must stop, what will you do to improve the national conversation? Uh, this pierces to the heart of why I am running uh, for Congress in the first place. Uh, this bitter, bitter, bitter partisan divide that allows us to get nothing accomplished. We can't move forward on immigration. How many presidents have tried to pass an immigration law that we still haven't? Health care. There's the Democrats' way, uh, Obamacare, the Republican way, and yet nothing seems to be getting done. National debt is going up and up and up. We've got to solve that problem. Opioids, uh, uh, we've got to solve that problem. And I think um, calling out uh, 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 ways when I get there and saying, look, guys, we got to work together. I want to uh, join the Problem Solver Caucus, which, for those that don't know, is a uh, caucus in Congress where you partner with a member of the opposite party and you walk into the caucus room and leave your uh, partisanship behind. I think we have to start a conversation. We have to uh, uh, work together. We have to not doubt each other's uh, 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 beliefs and faiths and love of this country. Uh, partisan divide is the biggest threat to America, in my opinion. Mr. Morelli? Yeah, frankly, I'm surprised to hear Dr. Maxwell uh, talk that way since he has run one of the ugliest campaigns filled with distortions and half-truths, which in my office we call a half-truth, a whole lie. Uh, his campaign has been nothing but negative. I've had people come to me every single day and say, why is he running such a negative campaign? He signed an oath uh, to carry, uh, the fair campaign pledge, uh, which he has violated. His uh, ads have been absolutely the ugliest thing I've seen in years in local politics and then talks about how he wants to go to Washington and work together with people. I've been very proud of my campaign. I made a commitment at the be beginning of this campaign. I would not criticize my opponent. You look at every tweet, every Facebook post, social media, uh, paid media, whatever it is, this campaign has not criticized Dr. Maxwell one iota and yet he has run one of the nastiest campaigns I have ever seen. It's fine to say one thing and do another, I guess, but when you get to Congress, you're going to have to do what you say, and people are going to be looking at that. And I'm frankly uh, disappointed. I think he's probably ashamed of it. Dr. Maxwell, I'm going to let you respond to that. Absolutely. Uh, I'm not ashamed of my campaign. And there is an alternative reason, uh, perhaps, why nothing negative has come against me. Maybe there's nothing there. I feel my uh, uh, one ad that I had that was a bit negative was enlightening. And I felt compelled to make that ad. And uh, two things uh, in particular. One is okay. an association with Sheldon Silver, and the second is the rape allegation from 2001. And we are running out of time, so, uh, you know. Well, I, I would say gonna... this. <clears throat> the things that are in that ad are complete distortions, are not true. And I would be ashamed of it. I couldn't look myself in the mirror. I couldn't go to bed at night, and I certainly couldn't take the oath of office if that's how I get in office. I'm proud of the campaign I've run. I'm going to continue to do if I'm privileged enough to serve right. in the Congress. Mr. Morelli. I'm going to run it the way I've run my campaign. We're running out of time. I want to thank you both for your time, thank you. and thank you for your service. I am sure our audience would agree.